and Ephesians, this time it is the hardcore Jews who are against the Gentiles. And what are they saying? No, Gentiles must be circumcised. What you needed to do to become Jewish, you need to do to become Christian as well. And it's a real threat. And Paul insists that this should not be so. Ephesians 2.11 Therefore remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision, that was their name, outcast, the uncircumcision. You Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope without God in the world, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both what? One. Unity. And has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. Look at chapter 4. Still Ephesians. Verse 1. I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. With all humility and gentleness. Why is he talking about these things? Humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with one another in love. Why is this language here? Be gentle with one another. Be humble towards one another. Be patient with one another. Bear with one another in love. Eager, it's there in verse 3, to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. What's he addressing? Division. It was real. And then look at the language in verse 4. There is one body, one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your core. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and Father of all. Why? One, 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 one. Why? The threat of division. You are one. Quit fighting. Look at Philippians. If you don't know about division in Philippians, then... You have really missed it. Paul is happy. He's joyful in Ephesians. There's only one thing that makes, that fails to complete his joy. And guess what it is? Division. Chapter 2, the famous chapter we've all memorized. Let this mind that is in Christ be in you. Right? What is that all about? That is about the threat of division. Ephesians 4 verse 1, Therefore my brothers whom I love, and long for my joy and crown, stand firm, thus in the Lord my beloved. Uh, sorry, verse, chapter 2, verse 2, sorry. Complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Why? Same, same, one, unity. And then when you get to chapter 4, which I ended up reading, you see the, the, he's now really hitting at the issue. Chapter 4, verse 2. I entreat your dear and I entreat Sinteke to agree in the Lord. Let Tell those guys to stop fighting. Verse 3, chapter 4. Yes, I ask you also, true companion, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. These are people I have worked with and these are my co-laborers, these ladies. They've come alongside me in the labor and now they are fighting. The threat of division. It was real can hardly get through a New Testament epistle without the issue coming up. And thankfully for us at Hillview, have we had division? 
give me your opinion after I come down and we're chatting. Thankfully, in my opinion, we've been fairly unified. We have moved together in one direction, but the threat of division is always there. It's always real. And in our passage, go back to 1 Corinthians, the division is taking place over what? Personalities. Some follow Paul, some follow Apollo, some follow Peter. The sources of division are uncountable in a church. Almost anything can bring division in a church. Almost anything. And we can never even know and anticipate what the cause of division will be. We can't see it coming. Because it can really be anything. So, how does Paul deal with this threat? By pointing to the foundation. Verse 11, 1 Corinthians 3. For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. The right foundation for the church is Jesus Christ. If that is the foundation of the church, if that is what the church is all, all the church people in the church are looking at, focusing on, pursuing, they can get through anything. They can survive anything which brings the threat of division. So let me lift up two things from this verse. First, Christ is the only foundation. Second, Christ is the sure foundation. The right foundation is Christ because he is the only foundation. First point. Verse 11, 1 Corinthians 3. For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. There is no other foundation for the church other than Christ. Now, does that mean that churches do not establish other foundations? They do. But Paul's point is that the only true foundation for a church is Christ. His point is that Christ is the only true foundation. This has to be clear and real if a church is going to survive the threat of division. Because if, if, if the devil can't get you to teach a false gospel and false doctrine, his goal will be to divide you. And it can't, we, we can't survive, no church can survive, unless it is built on the only foundation, the only true foundation of Christ. Christ is the only foundation. He founded the church. He bought the church with his precious blood. We are only here to begin with because Jesus paid a price so that we could be here. We would not be here even now at Hillview Baptist Church or in this conference right now if Christ did not die. In verse 10 of chapter 1, Paul makes this point. I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you what? Agree. And that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. For it has been reported, verse 11, chapter 1 of 1 Corinthians, for it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there is quarreling among you, my brothers. What I mean is that each of you says, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, or I follow Cephas, or I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? And then what does he say? Was Paul crucified for you? Did I die for you? Did I pay the price for your sins? Or were you baptized in the name of why are we baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit? Because they brought our salvation. Christ is the one who paid the price. Christ is the one who died. Christ is the only true foundation for the church. Have you ever stopped to ask yourself, why am I even in a church? Why am I at Hillview Baptist Church? 
because Christ died to save you and unite you and include you and add you to his church. Why are we gathering this weekend when we have building projects to attend to and work which is piling? We are here because Christ founded the church. We are an assembly because Christ has assembled us. We are the called out ones because Christ has called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. That there would be colonies of believers covenanting together, seek him, seeking him and serving him together. That's why he went up on that cross to found and establish the church. That's why he was born. That's why he lived. That's why he died. That's why he rose to establish the church. And perhaps that is why in his prayer in John 17, again, what's his emphasis about us? You remember when we looked at it in the series in John, unity. John 17, 9, I'm praying for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. Verse 11, I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. I'm leaving them. Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. Why is he so bothered I mean, we are saved, right? We, we are saved. We are heaven bound. Even if we split up in this church and we go our separate ways, will it take away our salvation? No. If all the colonies of believers, all the churches disbanded today, will, will, does it mean that they won't go to heaven, those people in those churches? They will. So why is Christ concerned that they remain together? That's what he died for. He died to, not just what you are saved there in your corner and you are heaven bound there with your family. Even you there with your girlfriend, you are saved and you are reading your Bible together in your bedroom or in your house. Oh, girlfriend and boyfriend can't be reading in the bedroom. <laughs> Husband and wife are reading in the bedroom. Girlfriend and boyfriend are reading at the restaurant at Nando's. So why isn't that good enough for Christ? Why should he be praying to the Father before going to die on the cross? Father, let them be one. Let them be united. That's what he died for. He didn't die that you should be isolated somewhere in a corner. He died that you should come together as a community of believers and do life together. Serve him together. Weep together. Rejoice together. Plant churches together. Minister to a dying world together. And he knows that these saved people are nothing more than saved sinners. The sinful flesh still reigns and runs in them. It's still working in them. Father, if you don't keep them together, they will not be one. I'm praying that as I leave them behind, may they be one even as we are one. In fact, the church is Christ's reward. The church is, that's why he calls it his bride. Why that picture? You men know how you sweated to get your bride when they hammered you with that bill, which you were wondering, where am I going to get the money to pay? And you sweated and sweated until you paid the money to get your prize. And you couldn't wait for the reception to be over. Amen, brothers. So that you can get the bride who you have been working for away and begin your life together. That's what you sweated for. That's Christ. He died for his bride. For him, this is his reward. This, which you are seeing here. It doesn't look like much, does it? But for him, he's saying, this is what I died for. That there should be a, this assembly of believers that I can say, those are my people. That is my bride. That is why I died. 
For us, our reward is that the, a, a nice car, getting promoted, getting money, building an, a business which can bring in more money than you, you know what to do with. Raising children who are responsible and successful. When we get there for us, we are said, ah, ah, great, no, I've arrived. I've got my car, I've got my house, I've got my children, they are raised up there, and we're, we've arrived. What is it for Christ where he says, I've arrived? It's the church. That's his reward. That's why he died. Christ's favorite day is Sunday. And Thursday as well at Hillview Baptist Church. Because that's when the, the believers come together. That's when they assemble. As we are dragging our feet from work. Ah, anyway, let me just go. You know, no one will be there. Let me just go. It won't look nice. But for Christ, he's looking forward that his church is assembled. That's what he died for, to establish an assembly. You know, I love our approach in Reformed Baptists, at least the KBC model. Uh, I think it's the Reformed Baptist model as well of church planting because it really underlines this idea that Christ is the foundation of the church. Christ owns the church. I am Windulambewe, left my job uh, December 2017, resigned. And they were telling me, where are you going? And so on and so forth. I said, I'm going to be a pastor. You die of poverty being a pastor. And I said, yeah, I know. Especially where Reformed Baptists, I will die of poverty. <laughs> but uh, let me go and do the Lord's work. So I leave my job, I leave my career, come to Chalala to, to establish what? A church, a, a new community of believers. After there's a membership and a leadership established over the membership, I, the church planter, along with the sending church, Kabwata Baptist, hand over the instruments of power to the new leaders. Solomon Chingambu, Gordon Mackay, and Kevin Count. Were you there for that handoff? When Elder George Staley stood where I'm standing now and declared, we have handed the church over. When I leave here, I'm not coming back, so to speak. Because now, here are the leaders they will govern the church. Members, behold your leaders. Leaders, behold your members. If we twire, and in theory, they carry me with them. You've done your job. And now, you don't see me in front anymore moving things forward. It's the elders you see in front moving things forward, saying we now need to decide. We have reached a corner in the life of our church are we going to carry on with him, Mwindulambewe, or do we feel that we are done with Mwindulambewe and we must proceed with a new man? It's your decision now. And you have the power through your vote to say no. He used to insult me and he would treat me and do what? He must be gone. Let's look for somebody else. He did this part. Let's look for somebody else. And if that's the decision of Hillview Baptist Church, I can't come and say, no, 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 but I left my job. I resigned. Now you want me to go and start looking for work somewhere else. I can't do that. I must say, hey, they've made their decision that they need, they're, they're, they're going to move forward without me. Even though I'm the one who left my job to come and establish this assembly of believers. You know what I call it? It's brutal, but it's beautiful. Brutal and beautiful. Because it, it sends the message. It is not Mwindulambewe's church. Doesn't matter that he, he came, he was sweating in the beginning or whatever, he left his job. Doesn't matter. It's not his church. He came, he sweated, he put things together, and the church can actually now say, this assembly of believers can actually say, thank you very much, you've worked, now go and find something else to do. 
It's beautiful in my eyes because it sends one clear message. The founder and foundation of the church is Jesus Christ. All of us are dispensable. Paul is dispensable. Apollos is dispensable. Mwindulambeo is, is dispensable. Only Christ is indispensable. It is not personal order to anyone. There is only one founder. There is only one who died. And it's personal to him. Am I the only one who's seeing beauty there? It's brutal, but it's beautiful. Some people think that uh, Hillview Baptist Church has grown quickly because of Vodi Bokam. How many of you have heard that? I've heard it. Yeah, no, you guys have grown. It's Vodi Bokam. Dr. Vodi Bokam who you have there. That's why the people are coming there. It's true. We have a huge following online because of Dr. Vodi Bokam. Actually, media gets more excited when he's preaching than me. Shame on them. No, no, I'm joking. <laughs> he's, uh, even I'm excited when he's preaching. So the views will be phenomenal and great. But even the people who follow Hillview Baptist Church online, they soon start commenting on my videos. When is uh, Dr. Bokam going to preach again? Because this guy, we are seeing this guy every Sunday. We came here for Dr. Vodi. So they soon discover, oh, this thing is not built on Vodi Bokam. It's true that we get visitors at Hillview because Dr. Bokam is here, but... If you ask anyone who actually comes to Hillview, they will tell you that the vast majority of those who come are not here for Vodiboka. And when they come, they're disappointed because they see me for eight weeks and they're like, when is, why is he keeping the main man in the pew and keeping the pulpit to himself? It's because it's not founded on uh, Dr. Vodiboka. And to his credit, he anticipated this thing. I remember in the first year, 2019, when we had talked and we said, okay, what series can you do? And I wanted him to do the whole series in a row for about six months because there was an issue. I said, this is an issue that needs to be addressed in the church, so just preach it every... And he said, no, no, you are the pastor. Me, just give me once, once a month at most. They need to hear from you. It's not founded on him either. And the growth we have seen is not because of him. Thank God. Otherwise, if we lose him, we lose everything. It is founded on Jesus Christ. And what makes me most proud of you, Baptist Church, is that we have sincere members laboring to be obedient to what God has called the church to be and godly men, a plurality of godly men leading it. It's not on any one man. If any one of the four leaders drops, there are three who are still running to take and cover the other. I can confidently say, and I hope you can say it with me, Christ is the foundation of this church. Secondly, the right foundation is Christ because he is the sure foundation. Paul says this in his response to those who are saying, I follow Paul, I follow Apollos, I follow Peter. He says, no, the foundation is, is Christ. And he knew that there is no hope for a church if it is not founded on Christ. It is not viable. The only way you can make a church successful that is not founded on Christ is two ways. Manipulation. Manipulating the people. Tricking the people. Or threats. Threatening the people. There is no success or prospect for a church that wants to follow the ways of Christ. And they are not founded on Christ. That thing will fail. That operation will not work without Christ. 
Some use threats. What do they do? They tie your burial, your being buried to your tithe. When they hear, oh, this member has died, question one is, secretary, bring the record of the tithe. If this person was not keeping up, we are not burying. We will send a strong message to the church that if you are not tithing, forget about enjoying privileges in this church. Forget about the pastor visiting you and talking to you, giving you attention. Forget it. Unless you do A, B, C, D. We do not run on threats here. We let Christ reign in the hearts of our people. Some use manipulation. They claim to hear from God. How else are you going to get these people to do what you want them to do? You have to come up with stories. When you come on Sunday morning, I heard from God that I, I, was, I was just sleeping, guys. I was just sleeping innocently. And then, uh, in my dream, I was in a hilux. The latest one, eh? not the one from 2014, the latest one, 2023. And I said, Lord, what's going on? What is this hilux? Me, I don't even like hiluxes. And God said, clear as you can hear my voice right now. Pastor, the church must buy you a Hilux. <laughs> so I've written down already a message to the deacons of the model, the model number, prices, it's cheaper from, you know, and I send that message. Thre uh, manipulation. I have heard from God. Why? Because you can't open up your Bible and, and speak from his revealed word. You want to go into the mysterious. That's manipulation. They cannot ground what they say in the revealed and written word of God. They can't. And so they tell us about their dreams. That's manipulation. Here, we trust that when we tell you what God's word says, you go and obey it. We don't need tricks. We don't need threats. If we can tell you, ah, read there. This is where we're getting it from. You go and you do it. Because Christ is the foundation of the church and is the only sure foundation. We do nothing to keep people coming to heal, heal you. There's no attempt or thought to say, let us do this so that we attract more, so that people are wowed by what is going on here. We are regulative in our theology of worship. I was surprised to find that the music team had actually thrown out a song. You should ask them which song. From the Grace Hymn Supplement, our hymn book. I didn't even know about it. And they stopped putting it for us to be singing. And it just came up in a discussion. Uh, and they were, I don't know who I was discussing from music. And they were saying, no, it's not sound. The, the, we have issues with the song. So we removed it. And I said, wow, that's what you want. As a pastor, that people are saying, mm -mm, we are reading the scriptures and there's a problem here with this song. So he said, let it be on bench for a while. Christ is ruling. Christ is running the agenda by his word. And they, they even get alarmed when, when members are saying, no, that song, there's a problem with it. And I have to calm them down. Don't worry. These are reformed Baptists. Just be patient with them. They'll come around. And really, that's the point I want to make here. I learned very quickly early on in Uvia, this thing was growing, that I couldn't keep my hands around it and steer it exactly where I wanted it to go. There were details I would have loved to change. Details I would love to change right now that I don't have the time and energy to work on. You, you just can't micromanage this thing. 
you, you have to let it go and let, let, let loose and just stick to teaching what God's word says. And there are times when people have come to you and say, wow, I saw you, you do this, or you guys, I saw you do that. You are doing a great job as the pastor, and I have to shamefully admit, actually, I, I had nothing to do with that one. It was all them. I only discovered it the way you are discovering that that's what they did. Why? Christ is reigning. People are following the reign of Christ and following his word. They don't need someone to be telling them every day, 10 here, now 10 here, now do this. No. Just give them the word and they'll follow the word in their pursuit of Christ. It's impossible to run a church without Christ being its foundation. I'm not in your homes. I'm not at your workplaces. I'm not in your marriages and friendships to make sure you are honoring God. And I can't be. We do not have a system of monitoring the tithes. We, we do, I, I cannot even tell if the elders tithe faithfully. Do you know that? I can't tell. Because there's no record. We are, I'm not tracking anything. I'm sure they do. But I don't monitor those kinds of things. The elders are not detectives, spies with, with microscopes, tapping people's phones in the church. And they hear, oh, have you heard that one is doing this? And we form a, a, a committee of investigators. Go check. We don't run things that way. Christ is ruling. He's ruling the hearts of his people. We don't need to be there, micromanage. He, where you? What are you doing? I heard. No. Christ is the foundation. And it works because he's a sure foundation. It works because if Christ is reigning in the hearts of the church members, half you, 90% of your job is done as leaders. It's done. Don't need to be spying them. They will come themselves. And say, pastor, elder, I've sinned. You, uh, why is this person? Why is this person ratting themselves out? Other people are trying to hide what they are doing and conceal their sin. Here are people who are coming on their own and saying, I have sinned. It's because Christ is reigning in their hearts. You don't need to be a detective. Christ is reigning over his church, exposing those who are sitting and playing with sin in the church. Christ brings it out because he, he's, he's aligned with his people who want to keep the church pure. We don't need to be spies and detectives. All we do is ensure that Christ is the foundation of the church. And all these things fall into place. And we do it by guarding the doors of the church jealously. We reject membership applications. Ask the elders. We sit down with someone and say, I'm sorry. That is not the gospel. That is not salvation. And we can't let you in. You are welcome to worship with us. Sit with us, sing with us, visit us, have lunch with us, but you can't be a member because membership is for those for whom Christ reigns in the heart. It cuts down on our work because Christ is reigning in the heart. So no, you can't be a member and we begin evangelism. We cannot know, of course, 100%. We can only see what we can see. We can only hear what we can hear. But to the best of our ability, we make sure we only admit into the church those who have Christ reigning in their hearts. And thus we know the church will not fall apart. Because when you open up God's word, they'll submit. They may fight it at first, but you just leave them with the truth and you go. They are the ones who call you and say, ah, actually, what you were saying, I think it's, you were right. Let's follow the word. Why? Christ 
is reigning. That's what you need in a church. That's what makes a church viable. So, are you a member of Hillview Baptist Church? Is your life built on the foundation of Christ? Is your family built on the foundation of Christ? Christ cannot reign in a church where he does not reign in the hearts of its members. Did you hear that? If Christ is not reigning in the hearts of the members, he's not going to reign in the church. The church will do their own thing because they are enthroned on the, on the throne of their lives, not Christ. There's nothing you can do about it. You have to resort to manipulation and tricks. If he is not the foundation of your life, then he has not yet worked on you. He has not changed you. And if he hasn't, he still can. He is the one who makes us what we need to be. The government is upon his shoulders. If we trust him, in his death on the cross for our sins and plead with God the Father to forgive us and save us and cleanse us with faith in Jesus Christ he changes us and he begins to rule in our hearts and when we are added to this community of people who Christ is already reigning the fire just burns bigger and bigger and brighter as Christ leads his church but maybe you are a member, Christ is the foundation, but you are discouraged. There's never enough hands. The zeal is not what it should be. You're asking yourself, why, why? We are so many, and yet we are so few. Where is everybody? Discouraged to see not people, people not pulling their weight. Discouraged to see people compromising discouraged that perhaps the church is not moving in a direction that you sincerely and truly feel it should be, that it's not prioritizing the things you feel should be important. There are many things to discourage you in any church, and Hillview is not different. Regardless of how things are going, you can be confident that your labor is not in vain if Jesus is the foundation. If Jesus is the foundation of Hillview Baptist Church, you can't go wrong. Even if everybody who you are supposed to be running with taps out and you run with it on your own, you are assured that this is going somewhere. This will count for something. My blood, sweat, and tears are worth it because Christ is the foundation of this church. Why don't you, why do you think Paul did not throw in the towel? Under normal circumstances, Paul should have quit. We know about his labor and sacrifice, right? How he was on the road, planting churches, arrived somewhere, completely new place, and start evangelism three years. Until there's a church. And he moves on to the next one. They beat him, they sort him out, he keeps preaching until there's a church and he moves to the next one. And yet those churches were filled with disappointment for Paul. He tells the Philippians, you are the only ones who ever supported me financially in my missionary work. How? Paul, all those churches you planted, are they so dwanzy? Are they so, so, what can we call them? That they can't think to say, let's give back to this guy who's poured in so much and support his ministry. They couldn't think. He says, nobody has supported me other than you, Philippians. What an indictment on those churches. But that's the church. Discouraging. How was he never bitter? How was he able to keep 
going. In 2 Timothy, he talks about all the people who he had sent out. 2 Timothy chapter 4. You know what he's saying there? I've sent out this one, I've sent out this one. Showing that uh, Christ's prediction that the laborers are few will always be true. We'll never have enough laborers. Harvest will always be there. But the people to come and get that harvest, it's a challenge. He says in 2 Timothy chapter 4, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead and by his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word, Timothy. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching. But having itching ears, they will accumulate themselves, teachers, to suit their own passions. And they will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, always be sober-minded. Endure what? Suffering. It's part of Christian work to suffer. It's part of Christian work to be few while others are sleeping. It's part of Christian work to be betrayed. It's what you sign up for in the army of Christ. And you are suffering. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. Do what you're supposed to do. Be faithful. What about me? Well, look at me. Verse 6. I am already being poured out as a drink offering. A statement which, me, which, is, which is meant to say, there's nothing left, Timothy. The tank is almost empty. And the time of my departure has come. I've fought the good fight. I've finished the race. I've kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which is the Lord. Verse 9. Do your best to come to me soon. I need you, Timothy. Why? Verse 10, Demas, in love with this present world, has deserted me and is gone to Thessalonica. Christians has gone to Galatia. Titus to Dalmatia. I've sent these guys out. I can't hold on to them. They have to go and work. Luke alone, verse 11, is with me. As you come, get Mark and bring him with you for he's very useful to me for ministry. Titicus, I have sent to Ephesus. When you come, bring the cloak that I left with Kappas at Troas, also the books and above all the parchments. Alexander the coppersmith did me great harm and I suspect these were men who he evangelized, baptized, they joined the church, then they turn on him. You ask any pastor, they are there in any church. They turn on you. The Lord will repay him according to his deeds. Beware of him yourself, for he strongly opposed our message. And then verse 16, my interest. At my first defense, no one came to stand by me. But what? Or deserted me. How can the great Apostle Paul, who wrote half our New Testament, say that when my message was opposed, nobody backed me up? I stood alone. They all deserted me. May it not be charged against them. Why did this guy not throw in the towel? Why could he keep going? It's because of what we've read in 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 11. He says, according to the grace of God given to me like a skilled master builder, 
I laid a foundation and someone else is building upon it let each one take care how he builds upon it and then he says for no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid which is Jesus Christ despite the failings of these churches despite the failings of these Christians Despite them deserting him, turning on him, he was confident that these churches will pan out. I know the work. Somehow, somewhere, it will turn out right. Why? I know the foundation I laid. The foundation is Christ. He is the only foundation. He is a sure foundation. Even if I must run alone, I'll do it until I die. Because there's a sure foundation of Jesus Christ. Are you discouraged? That's my message to you. Run with it. If it is founded on Christ, it will turn out right. If it is founded on Christ, it will be worth your blood, sweat, and tears. If it is founded on Christ, it will be worth your money and your time and your energy. If it's founded on Christ, it will work out. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. And we are thankful that you are building your church. We're thankful for Jesus Christ, whose great prize is the church. It doesn't look like much to us. A bunch of saved sinners who tend to fight about nothing, who tend to be cold, lack zeal, discouraging to one another impatient, quarreling. And yet this is the prized possession of your son, Jesus Christ. This is what he died for. He is the only foundation. He is the sure foundation. May we at Hillview Baptist Church run with the ball like never before, knowing that we are built on the right foundation which is Jesus Christ. In his name we ask and pray. Amen. Well, let's stand and sing together. Glorious things of thee are spoken. Zion city of our God. He whose words cannot be broken formed thee for his own abode. On the rock of ages founded, what can shake their sure repose? With salvation's walls surrounded, thou may smile at all thy foes. Let's stand and sing. Then I'll ask, uh, I almost said Pastor Kaunda, Mr. Kaunda, to come and uh, give us closing remarks. Oh, we don't have it. It's not? Oh, it's the wrong song. Uh. Oh, how? Oh, no problem. I'm here. I will help. Uh, let's have the words. So it's glow. How many of us know it? Glorious things of thee are spoken. Zion city of our God. He whose word cannot be broken. Form thee for his own abode. On the rock of ages founded. What can shake the sure repose with salvation's walls surrounded? Thou may smile at all their foes. All right, from the top. Should I lead? Okay. Glorious things of the Zion Found it. 
What can shake the sure repose? With salvation's walls surrounded, thou may smile at all that falls. See the streams of living water springing from me. Such a river ever flows the first a search grace which like the Lord the giver never fails from age to age round each habitation see the cloud Good evening once again. We are indeed thankful to the Lord for that rich feast, as it were, of the word of God uh, on which we've been fed this uh, evening. And um, we trust that the Lord will continue ministering to us in the next few days uh, in like manner that uh, when we come in this period of our celebrations, that um, each one of us will go away amply and fully fed on the word of God. We are grateful for the ministry of God's word as has been delivered to us this um, evening. Um, today we, we are looking at uh, the right foundation, the church's right foundation. Tomorrow we'll be considering how the church grows and uh, uh, Elder George Staley from uh, Kabwata Baptist Church will bring God's word to us tomorrow. So as we have been in prayer the past few days, let's continue to be in much prayer for the next few days that the Lord indeed will have his way amongst us as his servants uh, mount this pulpit to bring his word uh, to us. Um, the program tomorrow, I'm sure you may have uh, the program shared on the various platforms uh, those on men's breakfast um, group, I'm sure you've seen the program for this conference, and I trust that the ladies in like manner have also been uh, given or they've had the program shared so that we are all on the same page for each uh, single day. And uh, perhaps in addition to the singing and the ministry of God's word tomorrow when we come, there will be a uh, short video show, uh, shared uh, with respect to the history of uh, Bapt uh, uh, Hillview Baptist Church. 
So it will be a very brief video show of some sort uh, for about five minutes. And then we shall have one on Saturday as well as one on Sunday, a longer version. And on Sunday, uh, you will notice from the program that there will be also a panel discussion in the period we are supposed to have uh, the prayer meeting uh, leading us into the morning service for, for that day. So perhaps this is just to whet your appetite and also to know exactly how the presentations uh, will be coming. You will notice just for purposes of uh, being on the same page that to, today and tomorrow it's 19 to 2030 and then Saturday our program will run from 14 to 16 and then Sunday we shall begin there as usual at nine hours except we'll not have a prayer meeting like I've indicated who we'll have a short video and then a panel discussion of the speakers of this conference before we get into the morning service at 10 hours. So I believe pastor has prayed. Uh, so I will ask that as we go out, remember to greet someone. And as you come again tomorrow, remember to tag along someone so that they too might be blessed in the same way that we ourselves have been blessed this evening. Thank you for coming and uh, see you tomorrow and good night.